Okay, hello everyone. Welcome. Uh, glad to be doing another live stream here. It's been a while. Um, if you're like me, uh, you enjoy props, you like props, and this is peak prop season. This is when it's fun to be a prop better. It's fun to try to find edges on little things in the games, and the Super Bowl is great for this. Uh, so for the next, I'd say, 90 minutes or so, we're going to uh, go through some props that we're going to look at for the Super Bowl and how to bet them and how to beat them. And uh, we're going to bring Rufus in here in about 30 minutes, and uh, he's going to talk about his method and his process uh, for beating props. And uh, I think we're going to have a good time. We're going to do some Q&A. We're going to do some live chat. Um, those of you who have been in one of these live streams before know that uh, we can be very active in the chat. Um, and I, I, think it'll be a, I think it'll be a good time. So let's go ahead and uh, let's just get started with this. So the Super Bowl is really interesting because we have all of these props. There's, there's thousands of props on this game. And... You know, these days, almost every sports book has prop bets on games. It didn't used to be like that. It used to be really just the Super Bowl was the only event that we had that had all of this plethora of props that we could bet at into. Um, but the first question you got to say to yourself is, well, why do we want to bet Super Bowl props? What what makes this so so great, Jack? Well, uh, this is this is a rare example of high limit, low hanging fruit. So if you've watched some of my other videos, you know that I'm I'm very keen to talk about low-hanging fruit and how you can use that to build bankrolls and lower variance and trim the house edge. Um, but with the Super Bowl, we have some high-limit low-hanging fruit. Now, it's not unlimited limits. It's not like we're going to be able to bet a million dollars on a Super Bowl prop unless you're a VIP at DraftKings or some kind of thing that you've done there. Um, but for the most part, you have higher limits. Uh, in Vegas, it's like $2,000 per prop bet, and you can pop it again if you give them some time and let them adjust the number and you can go back and, and pop it again. Um, $500, $1,000 limits is, is usually not an issue when it comes to Super Bowl props. So it's it's really kind of a cool um, way to kind of get some money down, especially if you're one of these bettors who's kind of graduated past props. You come back, you do some props for the Super Bowl. It's it's a uh, it's a good opportunity to, to make some decent money. And then the next wit. Uh, reason that we bet Super Bowl props is uh, because there's a lot of arbitrage and line value when it comes to these prop bets. And the reason for that is because it is a decentralized market. There's not really a Don Best screen when it comes to Super Bowl props. They actually are on the Don Best screen, but they do such a lousy job of it. And it's not populated by many different sports books. So Don Best is kind of irrelevant. These sports books can't really keep up with what the other sports books are doing with props. There's so many of them; they can't climb, uh, comb through all of them and find, you know, what their stat here and there and where the lines moving and what the lines moving on. It's a good way to kind of you can get an edge at a sports book, and it's not going to affect the entire market. You can go around and bet it at a couple different sports books at a couple different times, and um, it's it's really quite a good opportunity for a lot of betters. And, uh, and then the other reason that we bet Super Bowl props is if you're like me, you're the guy that your friends refer to as, oh, he's the guy that likes to bet sports. Um, and I think a lot of you guys that are watching this here tonight are probably the guy that likes to bet sports among your friends. And so they all assume you're betting the game. And so when you're watching the game, if, if you're watching it together, maybe not this year, but uh, you know, maybe if you're doing a, like a Zoom call together watching the game, uh, they just assume you've already bet on the length of the national anthem or uh, the coin toss or something like that. So you might as well have some action on it so that uh, you can say, oh, no, actually, I bet this because here's why. Um, so when we get down to Super Bowl props, there's, uh, there's basically about five different types of props. And I'm just going to kind of run through them here because that's going to set the stage for what we're going to talk about here the rest of the night. So there's performance props, which the, that's player performance or team performance. That's, you know, Patrick Mahomes over under 350 yards passing or uh, total number of field goals in the game, three and a half or some, something like that. Things that are be uh, performances done on the field, the way the team plays the game. Uh, these are performance props. Then we have game derivatives. And these are props that are basically based on how the game is set up and the, the opponents and the type of game it is. 
And these are more about uh, events in the game, such as like, uh, you know, will the, will the kickoff be a touchback and, and props like that. Uh, then we have the interesting cross sport props. And these are sort of in the back of the packet. You know, they're maybe five or six clicks down the line here until you get to the cross sport props. And, and what the cross sport props are is there are props between two different sports. Uh, you know, number of free throws made by this guy versus the number of first quarter points by this team, things like that. And, and they can be very interesting. And we're going to kind of get to why these are worth your time looking at them. And uh, then there's multi-way markets. And this would be the Super Bowl MVP. You know, there's 20 different players to choose from. Super Bowl MVP. Uh, th this year, a lot of people are very intrigued by who will score the first touchdown in a game. I see that a lot of times on Twitter. Uh, everyone's looking to bet that. And, you know, it's, it's not a bad market if you can get an edge at it, right? So we're going to look into multi-way markets and how, how they can work. And then the, the final category is the, the fun one, the novelty props, the color of the Gatorade, uh, coin toss, head or tails, uh, you know, stuff like that. N length of the national anthem. Uh, these are ones we always hear about. These are the lower limit ones. There's probably not uh, as much money to be made on these. Um, at least I hope people aren't making a ton of money on the coin toss prop. Um, but the point being is these are very popular with a lot of people that will be watching the game. Maybe it, maybe this is why you're tuning in here tonight. You want to get an edge on the coin toss. I, I don't know. But the point about this is all of these are beatable. And over the next 30 minutes or so here, we're going to talk about beating all of these props. So um, before we do that, though, I want to go through some basic strategy when it comes to betting Super Bowl props. And I'm going to start off there. And uh, this just lays the groundwork for the rest of the, the, the talk here on, on the, all the props that we're going to try to beat. So here's some basic strategy tips on betting Super Bowl props. First, the sharps bet early and the public bets late. Now, why does this matter? Well, uh, the Super Bowl props came out a few days ago. Uh, uh, it used to be in Las Vegas. It was the Westgate, Thursday, 7 p.m., uh, Pacific time, the, this past Thursday, a you know, week and a half ahead of the game. That was when the props came out. Nobody really did much with them until Westgate put out their numbers and everybody sort of copied or tried to replicate. Um, but over the past few years, we've seen that other sports books in town in Vegas have kind of jumped ahead of Westgate. They're doing them out on Wednesday. Uh, CG, when they were still around, I think they had them out on Monday one year. Um, and then now that we have regulated sports books all over the country, DraftKings, FanDuel, PointsBet, you know, the BetMGM, uh, they're putting them out quickly as, as fast as possible. They know there's a first mover advantage to getting their numbers out there quickly. And they just keep adding to them. Every time I check, there's more props that have been added. It gets a little confusing. But uh, the Sharps have already jumped all over these. And so really what we're talking about tonight, the Sharps have already picked over a lot of this. Um, however, this is a good thing to keep in mind for next year, for the next time you go about Super Bowl props, is that you got to get on get on them early because um, the Sharps are already on them. Now, what happens, though, is that the public bets it closer to the game, maybe starting next Thursday, uh, you know, like 72 hours before the game. Now, Vegas this year won't have as much foot traffic for the Super Bowl. However, uh, there's still going to be a lot of traffic, a lot of public traffic in sports books, whether they be online or retail, uh, when it comes to the Super Bowl. And the public is going to make their bets, and then the Sharps are going to come back, maybe 24 hours, 12 hours before the game, and they're going to go back and pick up uh, some of the lines that the public may have moved. Because in this case, the public does influence these numbers, uh, because the sports books sometimes don't really have a good feel as to which side the Sharp side might be. They don't want to take too much weighted action on a on a prop bet, that's tough to explain to management. So the public does have some sway in these numbers. And uh, sharps bet the unders because the public bets the over most of the time. Now, when I say public, I mean people, recreational bettors, recreational people that maybe not are not huge football fans or maybe they're not huge gamblers. Um, but they, they watch the Super Bowl for something to happen. And so when they bet on the Super Bowl, they're betting for something to happen. And the other thing the public likes is they like to risk a little, win a lot. So when you think about that, it's kind of obvious to see why the safety, no safety was such a uh, squares versus sharps bet for a while is because the public loved the idea of, you know, betting on there'll be a safety in the game and getting like, you know, 
eight to one on uh, there being a safety in the game. And they would come into Vegas and they would bet that down on the weekend of the game. Um, and by game day, right up until kickoff, you could sometimes find, like, I remember I bet one time, no safety minus 550, which is a ridiculous number. Um, and it was right in that streak there where we had like four safeties in five years. I think I lost that bet. But the point being is uh, the, the public likes to bet those long shots. They like to see something happen. They like that idea. And so that moves the line and then the sharps come back in. Uh, the no safety, no overtime used to be kind of the staple of sharp betters. Uh, those, those days are gone. I think the sports books have finally realized, okay, we don't need to move this line all over the place. Uh, we can set this at like minus 1400 on no safety and minus, uh, 1500 on, on no overtime. And, and we don't have to worry about the sharps cleaning our, cleaning our clock. Uh, and then the other basic strategy tip here is you can't have too many outs. Now, I say this a lot in a lot of my videos about other things in sports betting, and it holds true for, for prop betting. And that's because, like I said earlier, there's, there's a decentralized market here. There's no set market leader when it comes to prop prices. So the lines are all over the place, a lot of variance in the lines. And you can't have too many outs because you can always kind of pick and choose and shop lines and find the best, the best number. Now, some of you are in a good state for having a lot of outs. And some of you are in a bad state for having a lot of outs. And some of you, your state has no outs and you're still, you're still stuck playing offshore. Um, that doesn't mean you still can't shop around and look at all those lines and, and try to find the best prices. I will say that offshore uh, Super Bowl props are a little sharper than the regulated books. They, they've, kind of, they've, they've, they've been around the block. They know what's going on. Um, so it's, it's not quite as easy to pick off some of the, um, the lines offshore uh, like you can uh, in some regulated books, especially in some of these emerging states. And then the other thing is uh, be organized and be prepared. Now, I'm not saying you need to be like, you know, a, a big nerd about this and have a Google sheet and have it all tracked out like I do. Um, but it, it helps. It helps to kind of keep track of where the lines are, who has what. Uh, there's, there's really no rotation numbers when it comes to these props. So you kind of basically have to remember how far down you scrolled in order to find this prop last time you were on this website. Um, it's, it's going to be a little maddening, but the other thing is be prepared. And, uh, the way you can be prepared is I have actually right here, this is the prop packet. Uh, and you'll notice it's from the Patriots Rams game in 2019. And this is from William Hill that year. Uh, and the reason I save these is because oh, these sports books are putting up hundreds of different prop bets. And as a result, they often just copy the lines they had for last year, even though the teams are different when it comes to a lot of the game derivative props. And so their opening lines are pretty much the same year after year. Um, and you'd, you'd think they learn, but they, they don't. They, they just kind of cut, cut and paste last year's spreadsheet or whatever they used. And uh, so you can find a lot of, this is sort of like the answer key, a lot of the uh, lines, you'll know what they're going to open at based on saving last year's uh, prop packet. Uh, the other thing is, is the Super Bowl has a really deep playbook when it comes to the game itself, the, the coaches. Uh, especially this year, these two teams faced each other in late November. There is a good chance we're going to see some plays in this game that we haven't seen these teams run all season. Uh, Bill Belichick was always kind of infamous for that. He'd always pull out something in Super Bowl. Um, you know, Doug Peterson with the Philly special, everybody remembers that. Um, that's the sort of thing you kind of get in the Super Bowl. Keep that in mind when you're looking to bet props, because that could be, uh, especially if you're way deep in the packet of some of these third and fourth string players, uh, then sometimes they're worth a little gamble to, uh, you know, maybe they'll be involved in a play that they otherwise haven't been involved in all year to try to catch the other team off guard. Um, so that's kind of a, a basic groundwork of, of, how you should be thinking when you're approaching props. Uh, let's get into actually like beating some props. So uh, those of you who have watched a lot of my videos, you know I'm, I'm fond of this graphic right here. This is the money tree. And when I've used this in the past, I kind of il illustrate the low hanging fruit and how some things are easier to beat than others. And when I reference this with the NFL, I always say that trying to beat NFL sides and totals is that very top of that tree whereas trying to beat NFL props is much lower on the tree. Uh, but we're just talking props tonight. So we're going to kind of mark this tree up based on the type of prop. At the very top of the tree, we have the multi-way markets that I talked about. 
Uh, then we have performance props. Then we have cross-sport props, game derivatives, and then the low-hanging fruit is the novelty props. So we're going to go through each of these, how to beat them, what your approach should be, uh, and we're going to go from the top down. We're going to start with multi-way markets. And it'll be obvious to you at the end here why I started at the top and I worked my way down. So with multi-way markets, uh, we don't have a lot to go on. We, we don't have kind of the same way to beat them as some of these other ones. Uh, you can line shop to lower the synthetic hold. Uh, you can try to find the best price available. That's never a bad thing. That's good. Uh, and you can also bet your narrative. So I've talked about in the past how we have uh, qualitative sports betting and quantitative sports betting. Now, quantitative sports betting is all about the numbers. You're just letting the numbers do the talking, the numbers doing the reasoning. Uh, it's all based on the numbers. However, qualitative handicapping is largely based on uh, your own personal narrative that you develop in the game. Now, if you're if you're a person who uh, listens to the Bet the Process podcast, and of course, at the, at the very beginning, the, their theme song, which I don't know how they get away without copyright infringement on that, but... Um, it says, you know, find a tout with a narrative uh, if you if you don't want to bet the process. So we're not necessarily a tout with a narrative here, but you can have your narrative play into place here when it comes to betting props. Um, and the the example I'll give is on Twitter. Uh, there's a poster by the name of Ed Teach, and he got a little famous, more famous this week. Uh, ESPN profiled him uh, because he has these huge futures on Tampa Bay that he bet before Tom Brady signed there. And actually, yesterday on Twitter, he posted these tickets that he uh, played at the Borgata. And basically, he's betting a narrative here. He is saying that, you know what? Uh, if if Tampa Bay wins and it's a multi-sack or a slash a forced fumble game from either of these two players, um, then Tampa Bay, you know, might not have a multi-TD score. And it would either be Brady or the defense that wins the... Super Bowl MVP. And you know what? He's kind of right. And we know that Kansas City has a weakened offensive line due to injury. Uh, and so he bet on Jason Pierre Paul at 150 to 1 and uh, Shaq Barrett at 150 to 1 to win Super Bowl MVP. Um, these, are, these are pretty good bets. This is a good way to approach it. Um, and, you know, like, like he needs another $300,000, I, I don't know. But um, this is an example of betting your narrative when it comes to a multi way market. Uh, the next thing we have here is player performance props. Now, the way to approach these is has a little more, more options than the multi-way markets. Uh, we can line shop for arbitrage and middling ish, uh, situations. As I said, these numbers are all over the place when it comes to the Super Bowl. Uh, and we're, I'm going to get into that in a second here, give you an illustration of that. Um, and But you can also leverage your DFS skills. And if you don't have DFS skills, you don't have your own DFS model, you're not a DFS player. Well, there's a lot of websites out there that are really good at analyzing how players are going to perform in a game and setting up projections. And, you know, most of them are free, but you can also subscribe to some of these tools that, you know, help you kind of set the projections on, on how a player is going to perform in the game for DFS betting. But you can also use that for player performance betting in, in a game. Uh, you could also do hand quantitative handicapping. So quantitative handicapping, you could build a model. You could have, you know, you, could, you make up some spreadsheets and have uh, a, a kind of a, a numbers analysis of how good a player is going to perform in the game. Uh, but, you know, if you haven't done that so far, like if that's foreign to you, now's not the time to start. Uh, you know, you could watch the my Making a Modeler series of videos, um, but now's really not the time to start on that. There's That's too much of a time um, investment at this point uh, than you have time to, to handle. Uh, and then the other thing is, is you can you can bet your narrative, like we talked about. Uh, that's kind of a carryover from the last one. Uh, and let's, let's kind of explore that a little bit with uh, a certain player performance prop. So this line is actually available right now at four different New Jersey sports books. The first one says, will Jason Pierre Paul record a sack? Yes, no. And you see it's, you know, it's about a 50-50 there. Uh, the no is a little bit favored. Uh, the next one there to its side is sacks by Jason Pierre-Paul, one or more. Well, hey, look, uh, that's plus 125 on the yes, and it's no minus 115 on the other side. Hmm, this could be an arbitrage situation. Uh, then we go down to the next one here, uh, Jason Pierre-Paul over under half a sack. And then you go, oh, wait a minute. 
you can get half a sack. Sacks are not one or zero. You can be have credit for a half a sack. So now the question becomes is what happens here? Because uh, let's say you bet the over 0 0.5 plus 145 and the no, he won't record a sack at minus 115. You think you have an arbitrage situation, but what if he just winds up with exactly half a sack? Do you push the over under half a sack? Uh, and is that count as a sack for the first uh, one on the list there? Uh, you know, will half a sack count as a sack? Um, and in that case, you would lose and push on those two wagers. Uh, there was a fourth book I noticed that had it at 0 0.75, which uh, that's actually a good way to do it because you can have half a sack. You can't have three quarters of a sack. So that would actually be a, a better place to uh, to bet this to make sure that you're not going to run afoul with the rules. But that brings up an important point when it comes to prop betting is these sports books are in such a hurry putting out hundreds of different props. Sometimes they can get a little sloppy with how they word things. And you may have to fight a little if you get something graded against you that you feel should not be graded against you. Now, if you're betting offshore, I don't think you're going to have much much argument. You're not going to get anywhere with it. If you're betting in a regulated environment, there is the regulator you can go to to try to be the arbitrator in the situation. And uh, often it comes out uh, to your favor when, when you go through that. So uh, just keep that in mind as you're going through uh, performance props. Okay. Next on the list here is cross-sport props. Now, uh, cross sport props are things like I mentioned before, uh, number of free throws versus the number of points scored by a team in the first quarter. And they're deep down in the prop packet. And sometimes it's best to kind of start from the back forward when, it, when you look at some of these prop bets, because the first ones kind of get uh, picked over faster by the various sharp bettors. Uh, they don't get to the cross sport props until later. You know, that requires a little too much handicapping. So sometimes attacking the cross sport props first might be a good way to go. Now, again, here's some options on how we're gonna beat cross-board props. Some of them are duplicative of the other ones. Uh, line shopping isn't the best option here because often cross-board props are very unique to one sports book that you don't see that same prop at other sports books. Uh, but you can also still leverage those DFS skills and projections. You can do your quantitative handicapping if you've got a model, especially if you've got a model in both of these sports. Uh, you can bet your narrative, as uh, as I've mentioned before. But the final one here, and the one I'm going to linger on a little bit, is man versus team. When you have a prop bet on some some performance, look into what is the tail risk in in either of those uh, participants. So when you have a single person looking to reach a um, reach a performance plateau you have just that one person. And if there's an injury, it greatly affects that person's ability to reach that, that mark. Uh, if you have a team, one injury is not going to really affect the team all that much, you know, unless it's maybe the quarterback or something like that. But uh, for the most part, the team is not going to be as affected by an injury. So I have an example here of some of the, these are some of the cross four props that are in this year's packet at the Westgate. And if you notice, some of these are man versus team. Uh, Julius Randle, free throws made, minus one and a half versus the Tampa Bay Bucks first quarter points. So, you know, that's dependent on Julius Randle playing a full game, uh, playing to his average probably, uh, playing against an opponent where he could draw fouls. You know, you can kind of step into this. Um, and, of course, Tampa Bay Bucks first quarter points is a little bit more solidified in the projection. Um, Jason Tatum, total points in his game on uh, on that day against the Suns versus the Chiefs and Bucks second half points, minus two and a half. So you kind of work through these. And in a lot of cases, you're going to find that the team accomplishing something is usually the side that you're looking to wager on. And then from there, it's just to kind of uh, dig deeper and figure out um, if the line's good or not. Now, you'll notice on this screen here, all of these are offered at minus 110 juice on either side. I guarantee you, if you were to go to the Westgate now, some of these have moved because the sharp bettors get in there and uh, you know they pick off some of these and some of them know to look for man versus team scenarios. But this is a, this is always a good one to kind of look for some value, especially if you're one of those people that gets to the Westgate on that opening night 
uh, everyone else is going through those first few prop pages, you're deep into the packet and you can uh, pick off some, some value there. So the next one down the line here are game derivative props. Now, game derivative props, like I said, are things that are happening in the game, maybe the first quarter, uh, like the line on the first quarter, number of points scored, stuff like that. And we have, again, we have a growing list of ways you can possibly beat them. Uh, we can line shop for arbitrage and middling situations. And there's, I think on this one, there's probably the most amount of arbitrage and middling situations when it comes to these game events. Uh, you can leverage DFS skills and projections. You can do your quantitative modeling and handicapping. You can bet your narrative. Um, but you can also, and here's the, here's the one I'm going to linger on, is you can look for mispriced value. For whatever reason, and it could be because they copy last year's prices a lot of times, uh, there's always a lot of mispriced value when it comes to game derivative props. And if you're kind of, if, if you do a lot of line shopping and, and, you, and you're very savvy with this, you can find them. And often it's better to just bet the side that's mispriced or the side that's not a good, uh, good price and save the arbitrage for, for something else. Uh, and I'll give you an example. This is exactly how these lines appeared. Uh, I would say it's been about 48 hours now. Team to receive the opening kickoff. Uh, book number one, Tampa Bay favored. Book number three had Tampa Bay heavily favored. I think where this was coming from is I remember when I was watching some coverage last Sunday night, there was a, a national commentator, I don't remember who, but they said that Green Bay made an error in trying to in winning the coin toss and deferring to the second half instead of giving and 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 thereby giving Tom Brady the ball first and you're letting Tom Brady's offense and you're you're playing catch up the rest of the game. Um, head coaches, teams in the NFL have been deferring if they win the coin toss for years now. It, it's really become the standard basic strategy. All coaches follow it, except one. Bruce Arians doesn't always follow it. In fact, Bruce Arians this year on two separate occasions received when he won the coin toss. And uh, those, those games were week 16 and week 17 of this NFL season. The three subsequent games since then that Tampa Bay has played in the playoffs, they've lost the coin toss. It hasn't been their decision. So when you look at this bet, you say to yourself, well, is this the same as the coin toss? Whereas the team that wins the coin toss is going to defer and the other team is going to receive. Um, that's one way to look at it. But you also look at it and say, is Andy Reid going to defer or receive? And I'm pretty sure Andy Reid is definitely going to defer that he hasn't, he hasn't received in a long time back from when he was with the Eagles was the last time he did it. Um, so there's a greater chance that, that Tampa Bay might choose to receive if they win the coin toss. And they definitely will receive if they lose the coin toss. So Tampa Bay was the value here. Uh, why that one book had it a plus 110 and then people started betting it and they moved it to even money and then people kept betting it and moved it down to minus 115. I think I checked it this afternoon and it's at like minus 130 at that book. Um, but really Tampa Bay is the side that is the, the better value here. Now, if you approach this back uh, days ago, you could have locked in a uh, plus 145, plus 110 arbitrage situation, which, hey, that's great. But really, the value is definitely on Tampa Bay when it comes to, to this prop. So a good thing to do is when you, when you look at these props, especially these game derivative props, is find where the value is and, and bet the value, uh, and, you know, instead of kind of always going for the arbitrage situation. All right, so the last one we're going to cover here is the novelty props. Now, novelty props. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can handle this. and. Uh, you know, we can do the line shopping. We can do the leveraging your TFS skills. I'm not sure if that really comes into play. Uh, your quantitative handicapping. You can bet your narrative. You can look for mispriced value. But you can also, and this is one of the rare times that I will say this, you can go with the wisdom of the crowds on this one. There's a lot of chatter about these novelty props. And there's a lot of people that do an insane amount of research into these props on their own. Um, and they do it every year. And they, they're watching old national anthems of when the singer was uh, in 10th grade singing for some local high school or something. They're watching, uh, you know, everything to do with these props. 
color of the Gatorade. They're digging in. They're trying to find people that are going to be on the field and, and tweet at them and say, you know, hey, can you tell me what color the Gatorade is and things like that. So this is one of those opportunities when you can do a little sleuthing around onto Twitter and you can find the people. Uh, I'll go. I'll give them a little plug. Joey Kanish just always seems to be all over these um the, these novelty props. So he's a good follow, uh, Joey Kanish, 22. Um, you can give him a follow and, and he'll tell you all about novelty props when it comes to the Super Bowl. Um, it's probably worth, probably worth uh, checking out. Okay, so that goes through that list of five prop types. And did you notice the trend here on, on why we start at the top of the tree and work our way down? Well, it's because as we go through each of these, the possible solutions, the ways to beat them grow as we get further down the the money tree there and when we get to the bottom there with novelty props uh we got you know a bunch of different ways to handle it and so that's what that's my advice to you is if you are new to sports betting or you're a very recreational sports better go ahead and start with the low-hanging fruit the novelty props um you know look for the line value in the game derivatives uh look at those cross sport props they can be kind of fun for you to try to figure out um, but save like the higher up ones, the multi-way markets, save those for people that might be a little bit more skilled at finding an edge. And the reason for it is when you get to the top of that tree, to those multi-way markets, since it's a multi-way market, the bookmaker has to bake in a lot of house vig in order to protect against scenarios happening, uh, you know, especially since a lot of these are long shot bets to pay off. So the, the house vig on something like a multi-way market who will score the first touchdown or or who will be the Super Bowl MVP can be upwards of 20%. Whereas when you get down to some of these other ones, some of these lower ones, uh, you know, you saw with the cross border props, you're betting minus 110 on either side. It's a 20 cent line, four and a half percent VIG, very affordable. Um, it's it's a kind of a good way to to you know to get into it there without baking in too much house VIG. Um, so my advice to you would be if if you're starting out at this, start with the easier ones work your way up the tree if you're putting in the time to get to it. Um, but for the most part, do your line shopping, man. That's going to be the easiest way to get an edge at this, especially if you have more than three, four, five sports books to choose from uh, where you're playing from. Okay. So uh, I know I sped through that a little bit because, and the reason I wanted to speed through that is because I got my special guest coming in here. And uh, this is the guy who he really made his mark when it comes to Super Bowl props um, he is, uh, he was in the, I think the Washington post, the wall street journal profiled him, uh, all these places, uh, the Las Vegas review journal, they all profile him because he has crushed the super bowl prop market for better part of a decade now, maybe, maybe even longer. Uh, I'm going to bring him in here. Uh, I got to swatch, switch some things here around on the screen. Uh, welcome in my good friend, Mr. Rufus Peabody. Rufus, how you doing today? I'm doing well. I think you oversold me a little bit, though. I, I win some, I lose some. All right. Well, it's, that's 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 very humble of you. But. I think I was. I mean, I was profiled by by the Washington Post back in. Um, I guess it was the 2011 Super Bowl, just because I think what I was doing was um, was interesting. I mean, uh, I knew a sports writer there, and he wanted to sort of see what it was like, uh, what being in Vegas for the Super Bowl was like, and so he found that he he you know he didn't come from the gambling world. This guy Dan Steinberg, uh, great guy, but you know, I, I think I was just in the right place at the right time, I guess. Um, although my business partners were like, no, bad idea, bad idea. Now everybody knows what car you drive. And so, um, but, Oh, that's right. Cause they talked about your car in that, yeah. in that piece. <laughs> that's, that's Still good. The same car. Um, is, is that the one that you kind of just parked out there in Vegas? Yeah. For a while. Yeah. It, I mean, it stays in Vegas. That's your Vegas car. It's nice. Vegas car. Some people use Uber. You just keep a car in a casino parking lot. Uh, not a casino parking lot. It, oh, okay. At a place I own out there. But um, so Rufus, I'm, I'm sure you're you're crazy busy. I thank you so much for coming on here. I know that this is a crazy time. You're probably flying all over the country, left and right, trying to get down on these props. Uh, How has it been this year? What have you been seeing in terms of the prop market this year? Is it getting is it getting more efficient? Is it getting softer? Is is what what's your general thoughts on on the Super Bowl prop market? So I think it is getting more efficient. And I think that's. That's not something new. It's been happening for years, and you have more and more people doing analytics. Um, which you know, ten years ago, analytics wasn't even a word. Data, a data scientist wasn't a thing. And so, a lot of these edges that I had initially were just being able to price derivatives better than 
other people, which to me is not super, it's not rocket science, but um, it was something that, you know, you need, you need to, you need some statistics background. You didn't, you need to know how to understand running regressions. Um, and, and now there's a lot of people that can do that. It's really easy with Python, with R. And so those things aren't as mispriced as they, they usually are. And I think the other thing is you have a lot of these sort of um, these books like DraftKings, FanDuel that offer uh, points bet, that offer props every week and they offer quite a wide ar array. So they are not, um, it's not a once a year or a few times a year thing like it used to be, which is the, the huge menu of props. And so, I mean, back when that was the case, you saw a lot of things that were really mispriced just because it's not something a book is getting a lot of feedback from. Um, they're getting that feedback once a year. Like I, I used to bet the no on roughing the punter. Um, the win opened it at minus 110 every year, it seemed like, you know, uh, Johnny Avello out there. And and I would always bet it to like minus 200 plus. And um, this is before rough, before you weren't allowed to hit quarterbacks. And so. Uh, right, and right. I remember, now, I remember them having that prop a lot. Yeah, um, I mean, it's still out there. What are you, what's your thought on, uh, I'm, I see a lot more derivative props that now. I see a lot more people, uh, a lot more sports books that are offering all of these, you know, it used to be alt spreads and alt totals were rarely offered. And now they're offered on every game, 40 points in each direction. Uh, do you find value in, in derivative markets like that? Sometimes. I, it, surprisingly, sometimes I do. Generally, not as much as I used to, but occasionally... Um, books are not particularly good at mispricing the tails. And, and, and a lot of it, it's just a function of, of the spread for the game and the total for the game, but in understanding how that distribution, uh, like how that distributions fit, but there, there are opportunities here and there. And I think, especially if you're line shopping, um, the, you see some, some pretty big differences, but overall the edges aren't huge. They just aren't. I mean, 10 years ago, there were, I feel like I had 10 plus percent edges betting alternate unders for the Super Bowl just because everybody thinks there's going to be a lot of points and mm -hmm. very certain about it, but uh, not as much as, as before, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so we have we have an audience here um, and uh, we have a very lively chat. Uh, I'm going to tell the, the audience, the, the chat, you guys can go ahead and fire some questions in. I will uh, we'll maybe pop them up on the screen here and, and discuss them. Um, and while you guys are doing that, if you do me a favor, if you're enjoying this content, if you're enjoying this video, can you hit that like button for me? Uh, I know if anyone who watches YouTube, you always hear the people saying, oh, smash the like button, smash the like button. Well, it actually helps because it helps YouTube kind of rank where they think audiences will like certain types of content. So when it comes to sports betting content, you can go ahead and you can like, you know, Vegas Dave or whomever, um, and they'll get promoted and other people are going to see them and you're going to grow his empire. Um, or you can like my stuff and you can help other people see this. And, and uh, I don't think I will have ever have an empire to build here, um, but I'm not going to be an empire maker. Um, but I, <laughs> you know, at least you can help out, get, get more eyeballs on my, uh, on my stuff here. Anyway. Um, so uh, I'll just, I'm just going to take a question that just popped in here and uh, we can, we can go with that. Uh, Akesh asks, who does Rufus consider the best sports better he personally knows? That's a good question. That, that is a good question. Um, I don't know because I don't see everybody's results, but, but I, I would say, I don't know. If, actually, I don't know if he counts anymore because he's now on the other side, I guess, but I was going to say, Matt, I, I don't know anybody sharper than Matt David Al. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, but let's let's keep focusing here on uh, on some of the props. Um, Jeff asks, uh, do the two of you think the markets are becoming so efficient, or are there markets being or are there markets being made? If so, is there a category of prop bets where the information is not as efficient? Okay, that's pretty good. Like we we just talked about how the, the derivative markets are moving towards efficiency. Um, are there other markets where we think that the the market is is still pretty rough? And there are inefficiencies to be taken advantage of. Well, and there are also derivatives of player props. So derivatives of, I don't want to say derivatives of derivatives, but you know, if, yeah. if you have, you have sort of yardage bins for quarterbacks and for wide receivers and, and running backs on occasion. So you can bet like Tyreek Hill to have, you know, uh, less than 30 receiving yards at whatever odds. Um, but I, I think that the, the, there are a lot of things out there. Um, 
I mean, the game props are pretty straightforward to price, in my opinion, at least. Um, they're a function of the, the spread, the total, maybe depending on the prop, the likelihood of uh, one team receiving the opening kickoff, as you were mentioning before. Um, you know, Tampa might be a little more likely in this particular game. Um, but player props, uh, there's a lot more there. I mean, you have to, like this week, I mean, do you think Sammy Watkins is going to be back to full strength? Is Antonio Brown full strength? What does that do? Uh, these other receivers is is Le'Veon Bell going to you know is Le well I think the Kansas City running back situation is extremely interesting because you haven't had the you know you haven't had their top three running backs healthy at the same time in what five plus weeks and so does Darrell Williams keep getting the carries he's been getting um, is it more you know is it what kind of timeshare is it and so I, I think you need to with some of these uh, like Darrell Williams for example I I, I don't think he's going to get a ton of carries personally but. He, I could be very wrong on that. So I think there's a lot more variance in in someone like that. And so maybe if there's an alternate, uh, there's if, if there's sort of I can bet I guess an alternate over on him or an alternate under. Uh, if the book the books aren't mispricing, um, or if those books if the books aren't pricing sort of the uncertainty there well, um, there there are some opportunities. But I, I think there's a lot of a lot of situations like that where you can't say oh this perfectly fits this particular distribution. I think normally. Um, the Passan distribution is considered to fit well for things like number of receptions, but you might have a situation where um, you think sort of two different things could happen. Like, like Sammy Watkins could be back in a full participant in the offense, or he could be sort of mostly a decoy and play a limited number of steps. You think Darrell Williams could be sort of the bell cow back, or he could fall back to the role that he was in. Uh, earlier in the season where he was getting what, like 12% of the snaps a game. And so, and then basically based on your probabilities of those, you, you know, if I run simulations, I can sort of see, I get sort of a unique distribution, um, which, uh, but those are things where like, there's an art to it. I, I, I don't know the answer to this. I, I'm, you're trying to read between the lines in a way. It's, it's kind of like the novelty props you mentioned in the fact that it's, it's an information game and it's sort of trying to read between the lines and, and trying to, make a professional guess about something you, you really don't know for sure. And there's no real way to quantify it for sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. I, you know, I'm going to just piggyback on something you said in there. Um, the, the running back situation for Kansas city is very interesting because we're also now dealing with a damaged offensive line and yeah. the running game is often a derivative of the, of the offensive line strength. Uh, same with the passing game as well. So, uh, there's a lot to kind of still go through when it comes to analyzing this game. And there's some things that I've kind of just stayed away from altogether because I just don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a sharp enough NFL better to kind of, uh, to stake an opinion on that. Right. I mean, it's uh, like go ahead. losing Eric Fisher is, is that going to affect can like, is Kansas city going to approach the offensive game plan differently than they would, than they would otherwise? Um, you know, are they going to be, are you going to see, is, is Kelsey going to be more involved as sort of a dump off guy um, if Mahomes doesn't have time or is Kelsey going to be blocking more? Blocking, you know, I mean, right. there's, you can, you, and so um, that, I mean, I think some football guys could have an edge there, but at the same time, like Andy, Re Andy Reed is pretty good at doing what the opposition doesn't expect necessarily. I mean, I think that's sort of the mark of a good coach. If, if the defense knows how to prepare for for your offense, um, you're not going to be as successful. And so, um, so, it's, yeah. I mean, this is hard. This stuff isn't easy. But at the same time, it's not easy for anybody. And I don't have right. to be right. I just have to be ha better, be a little bit more right. Exactly. Right. Less wrong. Uh, yeah. I mean, left, left tackle is huge. That's the quarterback yeah. blind side. Um, you know, it, if I was the coach, I'd want my big tight end to be blocking more to protect the blind side of my franchise quarterback um, in a game against a very potent defensive line. But let's move on. But I mean, Kelsey, uh, Kelsey does not block a lot. The, he, well, and he doesn't really do it as well as you think he should for his size. But he, we'll move on. He only he passed blocked on six snaps last week, three snaps the week before. I mean, he's he's running routes. He runs. But blocks. they had at least a, a healthy uh, LT at that point. That's true. Uh, David Zhao. More of Nick Kaiser. Yeah, uh, David Zhao has been telling everyone to smash the like button, so I'm going to take one of his questions here. A uh, good way to influence the hosts. Um, does the dog always have value in the Super Bowl? Um, no, no. The, the dog doesn't necessarily have uh, intrinsic value in the Super Bowl. 
what we see with the, the public when they bet the Super Bowl is they usually think, you know, if they like the underdog, they're like, that team's going to win outright. I'm not going to bother with points. I'm just going to bet them on the money line. Uh, maybe I'll bet them minus two and a half plus 175. Um, the public doesn't <laughs> think that way. Um, but That's or if they like there. the favorite, if they like the favorite, they often uh, take that team minus the points because they're like Kansas City's going to win by a million. So uh, I don't mind laying three and a half. So the point being is, since the public's betting in in those two buckets, there sometimes is a nudge factor to the line that makes the uh, Kansas City the the favorite money line or the underdog plus the points have a little bit more value. And sometimes they get a little bit off in relation to money line spread correlation. Um, and those are times when, you know, you, you look to play those things. Um, but in terms of intrinsic value on an underdog, because everybody kind of thinks the favorite is all powerful, not really, because these are the, these are the two best teams. So uh, there's a lot of people that think the underdog still has value in, in the Super Bowl. And uh, Rufus, do you kind of agree with that? Thought process. I, I do. And to piggyback on what you said with with betters betting the underdog on the money line and the favorite on the point spread, betters like these lottery type payouts. And yeah. it's why, and, and I know this isn't answering the question exactly, but it's why a lot of times there is more value laying a big price. For example, the, the no safety is the classic thing. Um, don't lay minus 3000 on it. That's not like, but I, I have it priced right around minus 1700, I believe. And so uh, at least in Vegas, you can lay minus a thousand or less at some places, but yeah. that, that's not a sexy bet. It, it's that, that's one where if you lose, it sucks. And I think there was a there was a four year span where I lost three of those four years. I still remember you had the Tom Brady intentional grounding on the first first drive. I think it was on a pass down the middle. You had the Peyton Manning snap over his head, and then I think a few years before you had the intentional safety by the Ravens on the last play of the game against San Francisco. Yeah. So. Uh, back to, I mean, you, you could get minus 700 like the year after that. Occasionally, like minus 650 would pop up, but uh, not anymore because you haven't had a safety in a while. But there is value in, in sometimes in those types of things because you know people, the public likes betting on the lottery mentality, the lottery payouts. Yeah. 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 Uh, good question here from Mark. If you had to focus on one prop market for Super Bowl, where would you start? Um, I don't know, Rufus, if you caught a lot of my presentation, but uh, I kind of went through all the different types of prop bets. Um, you know, I would I would start with, uh, if you had to focus on just one of them, the one that you probably has the most bang for the buck, the most money you can get down on it, uh, and, and sometimes has the loosest lines, are those game derivative, um, game situation props, like I talked about with who will receive the kickoff and things like that. Uh, I don't know, Rufus, if you have an opinion on that one? Um. The I think it depends on what your approach is. If you're coming from it quantitatively or or not, I, I would say if you're not, uh, you know, the player props might make more sense. Uh, if you are uh, maybe, or, you know, if you are coming at it quantitatively a lot, you know, the game props, you don't really have to do anything extra often, um, except, you know, it can be basically pure, pure statistics, but I don't, yeah, I, I don't really know how to answer that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, Marku asks, what do you think about Tampa's home edge? So a lot has been made this week about Tampa's playing a home game. Um, do you think it has really any impact? Marginal. I don't think, I, I don't know for sure in the past, you know, I, I've always thought that home field advantage was a lot more about familiarity about travel than it was about the crowd. And we know the crowd has an impact in in referee bias, but also, I mean, with more oversight of officiating, that's that's going down, and I think will continue to go down. Um, but I, I think it's possible. Like, but but then we've seen this year basically that there hasn't really been much of a home field advantage in the NFL, which kind of isn't this, which is, would other sports have not had that sort of same phenomenon though, at least from what I've been told. And so, uh, I would think in this situation, you know, Tampa. Well, I don't know when Kansas City is actually tra traveling or to, to Tampa, or have they already done that? I don't know what the COVID protocols or anything, but I do think sleeping in your bed, your own bed the night before the game, um, and, and having this routine that you're used to has to be at least a little bit of an advantage. Uh, I, I'm, I'm making it a half a point, but I could see an argument for zero, and I could see an argument for like a point and a half. So uh, it's, I really don't know. Okay. 
Yeah, fair enough. I don't. I really don't have uh, enough of an opinion. I'm not a sharp enough NFL handicapper to to kind of gauge what it is. Uh, I know other guys that have done research have shown that you know it's it's minimal this year anyway. So you know this is marginally minimal. Yeah. Um, uh, seven shots, not six. Seven asks how much does Rufus take away from the Week Twelve matchup? The same two teams, the same location. What do you think? I, I don't from it. I, I think that um, it's one week. Um, uh, obviously, Kelsey went off, and well, who really went off was Tyreek Hill. He had what thirteen catches for a hundred, two hundred and sixty nine yards and three touchdowns. Um, but I, I think I don't, I, I honestly don't make much of it, um, at all, really. Um, it's one week and, you know, I, I do think that there are you know teams like, like Tampa's defense is good at certain things, um, and, and bad at other things and, and they can give up these explosive plays. Um, but at the same time they have play, you know, they've, having played Kansas city already, um, I think they're going to probably try to do something a little bit differently potentially. And, and so I, I don't know. I mean, Todd Bowles, like, I, I don't know if he's going to sort of double down and just say, you know, if we execute better, we can shut, we will be able to contain Tyreek Hill. If we tackle well, if we cover better, or if he's going to basically say we need to do something differently. Like I, I really don't know. And that's, um, I, I feel like you can get really deep in this stuff, but, at the same time, you're, 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 you don't know what the game plan is going to be for this defense. And so the best I can do is go off of the data. And, and for me, it's just one data point. Fair so enough. That was a good answer. But... No, it's an honest answer. Uh, would you consider the penny lines efficient for player over under props? There is some wide variation in lines across books. Um, you know, pinnacle strength are like is not. like $250, right? I mean, it did. Well, what was I don't that? Think they have high limits. I think the limits. No. I mean, I don't know what they are right now, but in past years, they you know, the limits were quite low. I don't know what they are right now. Yeah, I mean, I I do know Pinnacle outsources their player prop lines. Basically, they use another company, um, Swish Analytics, who who makes their lines for player props. Um, the Pinnacle strength has not been prop bets traditionally, so I wouldn't I wouldn't read too much into Pinnacle's lines when it comes to kind of using them as a barometer. Um, it's tough to say who the sharpest prop betting book is out there. They're kind of all over the place this year. Um, it's, it's, How would you it's measure that? I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Would it, would it be like who based on opening prices? I mean, the thing is not everybody's opening at the same time, but, but the Westgate opens and William Hill opened on, on Thursday. And, and I think there were some major differences. And, and the question is whose line does it move towards? More, Ooh, right? I mean, Vegas I think that's market. probably the way to, 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 I mean, eventually you're going to sort of have some convergence because there's enough people arbing and, and looking for middles to ensure that numbers aren't going to get super skewed, but it's who they're going to. And, and I don't know if it's, I, I don't know how p efficient Pinnacle is. Yeah. I mean, for the Vegas market, Westgate seems to still rule in terms of where the market kind of moves towards. Um, but yeah, there are, there are always a ton of ARBs out there in the Vegas market. Speaking of Vegas market, somebody asked in here, um, do you think the pro betters in Vegas are finding more of an edge because Rufus didn't show up? Oh, I, know, I, Nick. I, honestly, I know Nick. I know Nick. I, I would love to hear from him um, what it was like. I know my friend Zach said that uh, he had to run a lot less, um, less sprinting to the counter this year because there's fewer people out there, I guess, because of COVID. But I'll be up there next weekend. It's, it just wasn't, a, I couldn't make it happen this week. Yeah. Um, my friend Frank said that uh, it was it was even less stragglers there early in the morning, uh, the follow on Friday morning. He's, he's He always used to tell me he would see you uh, early Friday morning in the sports book. And it was basically just you and him kind of picking off some props early Friday morning, the day after the unveiling. And uh, he said there was even less stragglers in there uh, this year. I mean, it's. I've always thought maybe I sh shouldn't go on Thursday to the Westgate just because of the influence they have. If I bet something that, especially with the sort of first and longest reception yards um, and first and longest rushing yards, things that are sort of more esoteric that that not every book has, or at least the the, the books that are out haven't put up yet. You know, if I bet it at Westgate, it's going to have a lot more influence on the market as a whole. 
And so this is this maybe this year is kind of a natural experiment in the fact that that I haven't there's things I've laid off of um, because you know I, I wasn't out there. But the thing is, there's a lot of people like me, like like Nick here. And so he, he's making sure I don't have I won't have any value next weekend. Probably, probably. I mean, the the sharps are everywhere. You know, there's the sharps never sleep. They're 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 attacking every book everywhere. That's yeah. there's no getting away from them. Uh, Mark asks, what's your opinion on Mahomes' turf toe injury? Do you think he will be hampered uh, similar to the conference championships? Well, was he really hampered in those conference championship game? I don't know. He, um, he was in terms of actually running. I mean, yeah. did you see him on one of those RPOs where he was like, it, it was ugly. Well, he got like nine yards on it, but he, it, it didn't look good. <laughs> Do I think he'll be hampered? I, I don't know. I mean, I heard from what I know, turf toe takes a little bit of time to recover from. Um, I, I, normally, I would say that, like, I bet on Patrick Mahomes under on rushing yards last year. It, and I got you with that, uh, the, the what, negative 10 yard kneel down or whatever it was. But I do think overall that that you're more likely to see Mahomes running in a, in like, in the Super Bowl or in a big, in a playoff game. Than a typical game, just because like Kansas City wants to protect, like he's their franchise. They want to protect him, and you, you know, it's it's about being smart and only using him in high leverage, like having him exposing him to injuries in high leverage situations. And, and the Super Bowl obviously is about as important as it gets. But uh, so, but you know, that's offset by the fact that like he may not actually be able to to, to run. So it, it's kind of tough, and there's a lot of assumptions you have to make there. Um, that's one of those where. It's literally just about my opinion um, and trying to quantify sort of something pretty subjective. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, uh, John asked a question here. Are there any examples of prop markets where you prefer to take them closer to game time? I'm trying to think. I'm sure there are. Uh, especially ones where the public is going to move the number. You know, I gave that example earlier in the talk about the no safety in years past and how the public used to always move that one. Um, that one's kind of dead now, but, uh, I, am sure there are examples here where the public moves the number and chances are the public's moving it up. So the, the value is going to be on the under closer to game time. Anything pop into your mind, Rufus on this one? Oh, like any big name player. If you want to bet an under, you want to bet it close to game time. Ba the, the way it works basically is if you're not hit when openers come out, there can be some real gravy. There can be some things really mispriced, but Basically, once once everybody's out, um, the the market kind of settles, and then as you get closer to game time, um, things get bet up. You know, like I think I'm going to get a great number on Mahomes under, on Tyreek Hill under, on Kelsey under. Even though I I have these guys priced like pretty pretty damn high, but but there's still going to be value on the under, I'm sure, because everybody's going to look at the matchup from week 12. They're going to look at what these guys have done recently, and nobody's nobody likes betting on on the unders, and so. Uh, if you want to bet an under on a big name player, the like day of the game is close to kickoff is basically the be like the best time to do it. Just because there's so many people doing that, and it's it's going to be especially in Las Vegas, um, where like a place like the Westgate, where there's going to be I don't know about this year, but there's like a 45 plus minute line to to bet on, on Super Bowl Sunday, and so it's they're, they're just getting they're taking so much so much action from recreational betters that the yeah. sharp the sharps aren't really able to sort of correct it enough. Yeah. That's where kind of betting on the app can help. Uh, yep. You know, if you're able to get decent limits on your app and uh, you can kind of pick those off as the, the public continues to kind of step up to that window in that 45 minute line. Uh, question here from somebody, if I owned a Tampa Bay future, how do you hedge it? Uh, do you want to hedge it? <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, you bet Kansas City. Um, but do you want to hedge it? That's the question. Is like, is this is this enough money? I mean, you've already kind of gone this far with it. Um, is this enough money that you you definitely need to hedge it? Think that through. You know, when you hedge something, you're taking a negative expectation wager and putting it against something that has a huge positive expectation already. Uh, and if it's not a case where there's some kind of like amount of money that is 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 totally meaningful to you that you need to extract from this equation in order to sleep at night. Um, it's, it's sometimes not worth even hedging. 
uh, if you have a future heading into the into the Super Bowl. I mean, you know, I used the example earlier of uh, Ed Teach. Uh, you know, he's got he's got like half a million dollars on Tampa Bay futures, and he had three hundred thousand or so on the NFC Championship game, and he had eighty thousand on them to win the NFC South, which he didn't win, but he also didn't really hedge that either. So, um, you know, there's sometimes the, you know it, having that stony cold resolve of pressing forward and and you know just playing your value is is the best way to do it but if you had to obviously um you know bed in Kansas City is the best way to hedge it i think you need um, to i think what you were looking for is the prop bet that maybe has some kind of value where you're not having to bet you know Kansas City minus 160 something um is there a prop bet out there that has the same type of situation, but um, you can get cheaper. Well, I mean, you could go Mahomes MVP. That's that's always the other side of it, since the quarterback is the MVP like seventy percent of the time. Um, you can lose both doing that, though. Yeah, you can lose both doing that. So really, like, just just stick with your your original futures bet if if that's the case. Yeah. Uh, now, Rufus, I had I had promised you that I would only keep you for a half hour if that's all the time you have. So, at any time here, if you need to uh, get back to crushing the world of props, um, you just let me know, and I'll I will we'll bid you farewell. But I really appreciate the time you've given us so far, and hopefully, you can hang in for a few more minutes. Yeah, I can, I can stay. I don't have anything going on. Um, so, I had a I had a, a question for you on. Um, when you're looking at a lot of these props, how deep do you go in your analysis, in your process of analyzing things? Do you go back previous seasons? Do you go back just this season? Do you go back, you know, how, what are your prior, how far back do your priors go? Um, and I realize it varies based on prop, but so I'll just throw out an example. Um, you know, if you're looking at like a big name receiver, yards, receptions, let's say Tyreek Hill. How, what's your process there? So it's okay. So where to start? Um, <laughs> I don't want to get without giving away too much, I guess. Right. Right. Like, I, I, so, so my base, well, first off, I, I kind of use sort of a top down methodology um, in terms of projecting a team out. So I'm projecting, you know, I'm assuming the market's right on the game total, for example. Um, and then I'm projecting out, you know, plays and I'm projecting out pass percentage and rush, rush percentage. And that's not just based on, you know, what Kansas City and Tampa Bay's rushing percentage and passing percentage have been so far this year. Um, it's it's also based on the game situations they've been in. And so, and then, and, and so, you know, Kansas City has been leading a lot. So they're going to be more likely to run in those situations. And it's how, how much they've passed relative to my expectation to that, what that baseline is. And so then I'm applying to that to what I expect the average baseline to be this game. And so then I have that and then I have dropbacks and then what percentage of the dropbacks are we going to see a quarterback scramble on? Um, what percentage of dropbacks are we going to have a sack? Uh, and then the rest are, are pass attempts. And then, you know, I'm looking at where, you know, where targets toward, well, targets to uh, wide receivers, to tight ends, to running backs. Um, and it sort of goes from there. And, and so with Tyreek Hill, I'm, I'm for the first thing I need to figure out is what percentage of the snaps he's going to play. That, that's that's number one and then sort of 1a i guess or 1b is is what percentage of the team's passing routes he will be running and so from there i mean that that's the way i approach it and then from there i kind of look at what what his target share would be what i predict his target share to be um or what percentage of plays he's running routes do i expect him to actually be the target on that play and and for that um i have a prior that 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 does involve the previous season um and but but for certain things like for example, uh, you know his snap count stuff, I'm not looking at previous years because that's largely those things are influenced by, um, you know, well you you can have a different team makeup and and for those things I'm you know, like Sammy Watkins was out for a while, other guys are out. I'm trying to figure out, um, and and so there's there's a little bit of art to that, but 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 certain things like receiving like yards per reception, definitely I'm using multiple seasons there. Um, obviously the current season gets weighted more and some regression at the mean, but uh, an interesting guy to think about is, is Kelsey actually, who his numbers this year are so much higher than they were last year and, and the year before that. 
and basically he's in the same offense. And so that's one where I feel like I'm, I'm ta- I can take a longer view and, and sort of go back and look at it and, and feel comfortable um, given that, well, feel comfortable lo- you know, using last year in my sort of analysis. Um, but at the same time, it is a different team. Like they were better at projecting the passer um, last year than they are this year. This, this, I mean, their offensive line is in disarray. And so, Maybe that that is maybe that's a reason the offense has had to do some different things. But um, but I do. Yes. So I do, I do look at, at the previous seasons, but not as much for more for things that I mean, there's certain things that sort of are more likely to remain stable from year to year with like Tyreek Hill speed, for example, rather than how he's being used. So. OK, that's 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 good. That's that's good uh, kind of background. Um I noticed a question here in the in the chat. Um, if I like the Chiefs in this game, will I find a better price than minus three, minus one five? That's a great price, weekend hacker. Um, and actually, I just I just saw he did another reply here in the chat that at a points bet is probably their big free promotion. Um, but yeah, no, that's a great price. We're not going to see it drop below that. That is, even if this line went and settled at the three, it wouldn't you wouldn't find minus 105 at anything but a promo price somewhere the market's not going to move that far. Um, that's, that's a, that's a really good price. Good job on, on grabbing that one. Um, okay. Nick asks, does the spread total make an impact when pricing onside kick? Yes or no. Well, I've never had it impact my onside kick. Yes or no. Um, I don't, I don't believe it. It would, uh, I guess you're saying, you know, if a team would be down more than 10 points, likely that's more than they're more likely to go for an onside kick if they get a, a score. So therefore, that makes the onside kick more probable. Um, I, mm, I don't think I would go too deep on that one. What do you think, Rufus? Yeah, I, I mean, I honestly, I, I haven't actually modeled that. There, there aren't a lot of props on will there be an onside kick, I don't think. I mean, maybe there are. Uh, and. It's it's just one, or, or I think in the past there was just one that where, it, you know, there's just there's a lot of vague. Well, there's actually not a ton of over round, but you, it, it's one of those where there's like you know plus seven hundred minus two thousand five hundred things. But I mean, I can like there's an easy way to t- to test. I mean, I, I can I can see why it could or how it could, obviously. Closer yeah. game, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting way to kind of put a different different twist on it there, Nick. So. Uh, that was that's kind of interesting question. Uh, this one just came in, um, and I saw Gronk, and I, I had some comments on this. So, how would you look at a player who hasn't been productive throughout the playoffs, but has potential to explode, i.e., Gronk? Does he have potential? Um, that's that's just it. Like, does, did he find a time machine before this week or something? Uh, here's the thing: Gronk is a name everybody knows. I'm sure people are going to be betting Gronk. There's probably a lot of Gronk props out there. Uh, Gronk is a shadow of what he used to be. So um, if anything on Gronk, I'm looking that, uh, you know, maybe the public will bet this one up and I'll be able to take an under on him. Um, but there is something to be said for last page of the playbook type of games uh, theory where, you know, they may put in some more Gronk plays here because it's, you know, unexpected uh, given how little he's been utilized in their offense this year. I don't know. He also has a long history with Brady and is comfortable with him. But what's, True. what's what I don't like with the Gronk unders, I mean, I think the, well, if you look, Gronk had one target last week, but he still ran 23 routes, one target. The week before that, 19 routes, five targets, only one catch. Um, so he's, and then the week before that, um, week 18, 18 routes, one target. But, and, and generally targets are a function of routes run. And uh, and then there's a, a player specific um, target per route run. But He's he, like his targets have dropped like precipitously given how many routes he's run relative to earlier in the year. And, and Braid has been used a little more. And, and the question is why? And and I, I think this is one where sort of I, I think the public may be betting unders more just because of the recency. They see, OK, he, in the playoffs, he's literally had one catch, one catch and zero catches. But That's true. he is running. It's not like I mean, he's still on the field. You know, he had 80. He was on the field for 89 percent of their snaps last week, 77 percent the week before and 74 percent the week before that. So um, I, I actually uh, I'm more likely to be betting a Gronk over than a Gronk under at this point, depending. Obviously, it depends on where the number goes. But um, somebody just said, hey, where's Rufus pulling these route stats from? 
Uh, you scrape your own data. Kind of, what's that? I mean, you can get that from like Pro Football Focus. I mean, if you have the the subscription, that stuff's available. Okay. Yeah, I mean, but you gather all of your own data as well. Um, I know from various sources and play by play and things like that. So, um, well, I get the snap count stuff from Pro Football Focus. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's. I'm not watching all the film myself and <laughs> writing it down. Oh, yeah, I, am I wasting my time doing that? Yeah. Um, so somebody asked a question here on the Calcutta. And so I, I thought, figured I'd just kind of interject this in here as well. Uh, for those of you who are fans of Bet the Process and uh, you watch the Calcutta, um, watch me sit on my hands. Um, there, so the Calcutta right now, pretty much Jeff Ma and Preston Johnson are running away with the thing. Um, I was I was kind of doing some figuring. I, I think if there's something like if either team wins by more than like 15 points or 17 points or something on the Super Bowl, they scoop all the remaining bets, including the prop bets on biggest winner and biggest loser. Um, and they would win, you know, they would take 200,000 Rufa coin um, yeah. by doing that. It's, it's just insane how they've dominated this. Um, do you think you're going to do another Calcutta again? And if so, is there, you know... Are you going to kind of make it so it's not so uh, exploitable by by one person? Exploitable? Well, I don't know if it was exploitable. They're they're getting very lucky, I guess. Is, I, I still think. I mean, Jeff said his number for Kansas City was like twenty something percent of the pot, and to do that, he had to think that there was a like two thirds chance that that Kansas City made the Super Bowl or something. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. Um, my thoughts are: I think you were smart to not to to not bid on any team. It, it, you ended uh, up being, yeah, yeah. I mean, I came in with some numbers, and it quickly was evident to me that uh, I would not be comfortable getting. I could, you know, I could easily get one team, maybe one or two, but I was not going to be comfortable with risking that much for uh, just one or two teams. So I, I probably should have gathered some investors or something beforehand, but. Anyway, I, I don't regret that. I, I I think it was kind of fun. I think the people had a lot of fun watching that, so I was glad to be a part of that. Um, but anyway, uh, somebody I else. With, had, I agree uh, with Jay Rose. I think Jeff overpaid and got lucky with the Chiefs. Don't tell. That was that. a lot. I think it was eighty nine thousand is what he paid for for the Chiefs, which was by far the the highest price paid. Uh, yeah. Uh, so somebody had asked here, uh, let me just find where it was. Um, Van had asked, which prop pairs obviously cancel each other out if you bet them both? And I think this had to do with um, what, what scenarios where like you can bet one thing and then on the other side, like another different prop set a different way maybe find like arbitrage or something. I don't, I, I guess it's what he's kind of looking forward to here. Um, Nothing comes immediately. I'm, to mind. I'm not, I'm, I'm sure I'm not I sure when he says, Van, if you want to put in the chat, exactly what you meant by this one a little bit better, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, and again, Rufus, if you're, if you're pressed on time, just let me know. I'm good. I don't want to. Okay. Okay, good. Um, Cause we got other questions here. I'm just kind of circling back to some of these. Uh, do you have any ideas for touchdown props, uh, jo Johan or Johan? This is a little bit open ended. So, um, uh, it, it, you mean the like person to score the first touchdown of the game, or how many touchdowns a person will get? I mean, I have ideas for touchdown props that aren't props, but would be cool ones. Like what? I don't know. Will a touchdown? Will you have an exactly a, you know? Seven yard touchdown. I don't know. That's actually that's not a very fun one. But will one player score consecutive touchdowns? I don't. Know. I mean, you you could. There's like an infinite number of possibilities. But I would say if you're approaching touchdown props in general, the most likely ones you're approaching are, are going to be the first or last touchdown. A player to for, score the first or last. Uh, and I mean, I think the big thing there is you say you need to figure out what. Um, what the likelihood of each team scoring that first touchdown is. So in this case, you know, the 
three point favorite. It's going to be in the sort of 52, 53, 54 percent range, something like that uh, for for Kansas City, at least if you're just going off the spread. And um, and then basically it's it's sort of, uh, you know, you're allocating a certain number of touchdowns to Kansas City. Now, what what percentage of those touchdowns are going to go to to each player? Um, so with Mahomes, I know Mahomes first touchdown is a very popular bet. And Mahomes has something like 20% of the Chiefs rushing touchdowns over the last two two seasons. And if you said, okay, the Chiefs are, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, they're 30% likely to get a rush touchdown and 70% likely to get a pass touchdown for that first touchdown. Um, well, there's also the possibility of defensive or special teams touchdown, actually. Um, and Mahomes is going to get 20% of the team's rushing touchdowns. You know, you'd be like, okay, 30% times 20%. Um, and they and you have six percent and so six, he'll score he's six percent times you know if they're 55 percent to score the first touchdown there you go you got your number there and uh i mean that's the way i would approach those things kind of just it's very very logical and breaking yeah. something breaking it down into its component parts yeah no i i agree with that uh, Flex asks, what would be your biggest sweats this year? Would they be on the game or on the props? Uh, I have a, you know, I ha I'll, I'll tell you guys, I have a position right now on um, Tampa Bay plus three and a half minus 110. I grabbed that right when the line opened, uh, jumped right on it because I knew that that wouldn't last. Uh, so I, I chunked out a good amount of money on it. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I don't know if I'm, I'm going to keep it or if I see a decent price on Kansas City money line. I might, you know, play back uh, some of it there and, you know, go for that one, two, three point game uh, middle attempt. Um, so for right now I got a, I got a big position on Tampa Bay. If I, for some reason, if I forget to um, hedge it off or if I let it ride, uh, you know, it's a, it's a decent size sweat. Um, but in terms of one of the things that I've always found when I'm, when I'm betting the Super Bowl is I get done all of these prop bets. And I, you know, got all this this spreadsheet, and I look them all over, and I realize how many are correlated, how many are basically betting that narrative on the game of this will, you know, this will happen, all of these will win, and if this doesn't happen, all of these will lose, and that becomes the biggest sweat on the game. And inevitably, there's going to be a position, a time, either right before the game or after the game kicks off, when I go, oh man, you know what, I'm, I'm, you know, if this doesn't go my way, I'm kind of screwed with all this work that I've done in the last couple of weeks. I don't know, Rufus, are you, do you kind of run into the same situation? You know, I think there are a good number of correlations, but I, I just, I generally have so many things that are, you know, that it's going to be really impossible for me to like lose everything or win everything. Especially if you add in the game drops, you know, something that's like, will there be a score in the first five minutes of the game? Like that's not related as much to like Chris Godwin's receiving yards. Yeah, but no. wait for that touchdown thing though. So uh, I think the um, who was it? Uh, Johan, first first touchdown or scoring touchdown in the game. I oh, just yeah. want to say, go from th that approach. Also works to figure out a player's odds to score a touchdown in that game. If you say he's six percent to score each touchdown, the Chiefs score. Well, how many how many touchdowns are the Chiefs going to score? There's a sort of a distribution of that, and so you can say, well, if if the Chiefs score exactly seven touchdowns. Um, and Mahomes is six percent to score each of their touchdowns. You know that's point well point nine four to the seventh. One minus point nine four to the seventh is the chance that Mahomes uh, does not score a touch or does score a touchdown if they score exactly seven touchdowns. And so you can kind of use. I mean, it, again, it's it's basically just logic. Uh, what percentage of the money you're getting down is being done in a in regulated markets? Um, I'll answer this one because actually this year I will be 100% betting in regulated markets. Uh, I, I, I'm not putting anything offshore this year. Um, I have some offshore accounts, but I, uh, I'm kind of purposely steering away from them just to see if it's possible for someone to, uh, as a professional gambler, to do this just in regulated markets or if the limits and the BS that you run into in some of these regulated shops um, prevents that from being really viable. So that's one of the things I've just been trying for myself and maybe I'll do some videos on it down the line. But this year, uh, 100% of my money is being done in the, uh, the regulated markets here in, in New Jersey. Uh, I don't know if Rufus, you don't have to answer that if you don't want to, but... 90% plus. Oh, wow. That's more than yeah. I would have expected. 
Interesting. Uh, another question from Nick here. What, when pricing rare events, such as special team touchdowns, defensive touchdowns, et cetera, how would you weight team versus league averages? And how many years back are you looking? Um, That's a great you know, question. I, yeah, I'll, I'm going to give you a little second to think because you're over here. Um, because I, 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 get, I run into this with some of the other bets that I make in other sports. Um, and I often find that weighting uh, a, a team average or a league average on something that's a rare event is sometimes a, a bad way of doing it. And what I've often found is often you, you need to take on more the median result of um, not so much the mean. And uh, I found that helps a lot with kind of gauging uh, where things should be. And then you need to apply a distribution where zero is not um, a, a a death factor into it because it's going to be zero a lot of the times. Um, so, you know, Poisson distributions are good. Um, you know, like a reverse binomial distribution is, is sometimes good for that. A negative um, binomial? Get... What's that? A negative binomial? Yeah, negative. I knew I was saying that. I was, wrong like, I was like, what is the reverse binomial? I would love to yeah. know. <laughs> Super secret. It's, um, it's the opposite of a binomial. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Negative, negative binomial. Um, but you know, I don't. I don't want to get too much into the weeds with that. But yeah, there's there's certain things you can do there, especially when you come up with things that are more rare events. Uh, so Rufus, go ahead, give your opinion on this one. No, I was going to say. I mean, you're right. Poisson is is your friend. Negative binomial is essentially a Poisson is essentially a form of negative binomial. Negative binomial allows you to have more variance because with Poisson, the mean has to equal the variance. Sorry, we're getting a little bit nerdy here. Um, with the negative binomial, you can have variance that is that is greater than the mean. Um, and it works for counting stats. So I, I actually, I have a negative binomial calculator, with, which I really like, which I use for for re re receiver receptions because certain guys are going to be higher variance. Um, but for stuff like special team touchdowns, defensive touchdowns, um, you know, I, I don't know off the top of my head how much I'm looking, you know, but I mean, it's going to be almost all league rather than team. I mean, if you think about defensive touchdowns, what are the things that can cause it? Um, a team that gets a lot of interceptions, a team and how do you get interceptions or interceptions or fumbles, you know, putting pressure on the quarterbacks one. Um, but in terms of, I don't think there's a ton of, of signal in terms of um, I guess, interception return for a touchdown rate. You know, there's not a big difference between teams or it's just really hard to identify because you don't have a ton of interceptions. So with something like that, if you wanted to break it down into that piece, like what, what's the likelihood of an interception, if there's an interception, what's the likelihood of it being returned for a touchdown? You, you could go at it that way. Uh, but for these things, I mean, there's a ton of regression to the to to, to the mean, um, the league average. And in terms of um, in terms of la like how many years to look at, that's a really interesting question and one that that's difficult. I mean, it's um, in my code. I, I've in the past done weighted averages of the last few seasons, but it's not as simple as that, especially with something like I mean, if there's rule changes, for example, special teams touchdowns you know, are much, much less likely than they used to be given the the new, well, the kickoff touchback rules. And so, um, you know, you might say, okay, I'm going to, there's bit, like, I guess when I think about that, the question is how much has the game fundamentally changed? And so if, if I think the game has been the same in the last three years, then I'm fine just using league average in the last three years. Mm -hmm. But if I think it's fundamentally changed, you know, I want to use data since it has changed. And I think, you know, the, 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 the most conservative way is to sort of decay and say, okay, I'm going to wait this season, the most last season, a little like less, and then the season before less than that, if you don't really have any intuition on that, but um, there isn't, uh, I, I wouldn't say there's, um, there's a right or wrong way to do it. Oh, no, there is a wrong way. I just don't think there's one right way. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Mark asks, can you speak to the amount you should bet on a side total compared to a prop? Well, Mark, this is this is more of a personal question for you know for any better looking into it. Um, I, you know, I I use basically a Kelly criterion when I bet size, um, and that is I'm kind of betting my edge, but at the same time, you got to be respectful of the market and how much the market can take. So even if you're using a fractional Kelly criterion, like you're betting. Uh, one quarter of whatever your edge is on a bet, uh, you know, sometimes that's you know, on a prop bet. That's that's more than the market's going to be able to bear in terms of the wager. So, um, you know, uh, 
Typically on the Super Bowl, though, I tend to have less on the game itself and more on prop bets, and that's in aggregate. Um, I, I usually don't have a position on the game where I'm actively sweating that game in any way. Uh, my bets are usually on the the prop markets in in whole. Uh, I don't know, uh, Rufus. I'm sure in your case you have far more on the props than you do on the actual game or total itself, right? Yeah, definitely. I have yeah. almost nothing. I mean, I'll, I'll have stuff generally correlated to one side, probably, potentially. Um, and in this game, I, I may have a position. I, I I like the Bucks here. I haven't bet it yet. I, I you know, if I could have gotten plus three and a half, minus one ten, I would have. But I think, especially if the line goes up to three and a half, I'll definitely take some. But I'm going to have hopefully a lot of positions that are sort of a little bit correlated with that as well. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. If you missed the if you missed the spread, um, Blake had asked, "Do you guys personally get bigger limits from sports books on the Super Bowl, or the sports books that you have limited you keep you limited?" Uh, well, Blake, is there, you know, as I'm fond of saying, there's the science of sports betting and there's the art of sports betting. Um, so getting the money down is the art of it. And so even sports books that have limited me, um, there are ways to, you know, get the money down. Um, I generally, you know, that's, that's a lot of the work that I do is getting the money down that I want to wager. So, um, I, I haven't run into limits so far this, this Super Bowl anywhere. Um, but at the same time, I'm not really hammering the props at the same level that maybe Rufus would be hammering the props. So I, you know, I'm probably maybe not the correct person to ask Rufus. Have you seen limits that you're just like, come on guys, what are you doing? I mean, basically everything, right? I mean, the but most you're on, getting, sorry, even on this, even on this game at, you know, this time, have you had sports books where they're not even giving you a fair shake for like a thousand dollar? For props, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would some say of the a lot of US seen. ones. I mean, last year, I remember I was in New Jersey and there was one book. I, I, I kept trying to, I was firing some game derivative stuff. They were, it was like $150. And then I got limited to $50. And it's the Super Bowl. It's not, these weren't like super esoteric markets. And so I, that was disappointing to me. But you know, Westgate takes two thousand dollars. South Point takes two thousand dollars. Stations will take, I believe, two thousand um, dollars starting tomorrow, probably. Uh, or I think initially they take a thousand and they go up to two thousand. So um, I, I like the way the Vegas books do it, where they have a posted limit, and it's the same for everybody. Everybody knows that, unless you're, you know, some crazy whale that they'll they'll take more from from. But everybody's guaranteed at least that limit number, and it, it's. Like I don't know where my limits in like New Jersey or Indiana or you know the legal states um, with these you know fan duels, DraftKings, et cetera, of the world like where they stack up to other people's. Um, I don't know. Like I don't know what my percentage of the full limit is, so I, I can't speak to that. But but I I I think the you know I assume I'm whatever the same percentage just as I would be any other game. Yeah. Um... And, and Mark was uh, the previous question back. Um, he was relating that to some of my earlier videos where I said, don't be too aggressive with prop bets. Uh, yes. If, if earlier in my presentation that I gave in the first half hour here tonight, uh, I was kind of mentioning that Super Bowl is a good instance of high limit, low hanging fruit. Um, you can bet higher limits on the Super Bowl props than you could. Um, and the sports book takes the action. You know, they, this is sort of a traditional liquidity. They, they don't mind this as much. Um, it's, it's sort of a special scenario. So, um, I have found that it's sometimes a lot easier to get money down on the Super Bowl than it is on, um, regular games and, and, you know, than it would be and the tolerance is higher on, on the props. So we're coming up on 90 minutes here. Um, so I'll just kind of throw this out there. If you guys have any last round of questions, question that you've been kind of sitting on, you want to make sure you get answered tonight. Um, Rufus has been kind enough to stay on longer than I uh, had expected him to be able to. So we'll wrap this up in the next five minutes here. So go ahead and get some your last minute questions in here. Um, Blake, I guess this follow up to, to me or to Rufus is why wouldn't you use some offshore if you're getting limited so much? Well, you know, there's a lot of, I'm not opposed to offshore sports betting. Um, there's a lot of things to like about regulated sports betting though. And one of the situations is 
the the scenario I gave earlier in the presentation where I said, you know, this sack prop is poorly worded across multiple books. What if JPP winds up with half of a sack? What's going to happen? Uh, offshore, I guarantee you, it's probably not going to go your way. It's, it's just traditional. They tell you to pound sand. Uh, old Tony from Five Diamonds used to tell you in more colorful words. Um, but onshore, in regulated markets, there's there's a regulator you can go to, and, and they can resolve these things. And so it's a, it's just a lot easier. I, look, I can deposit money straight from my bank account into the sports book here, and um, you know I can... I can move a million dollars a day into a sports book in New Jersey. It's amazing. Um, I don't think I could do that offshore very easily. Um, so that's you know one thing to consider. Offshore has plenty of benefits, and I don't want to get into that debate. But um, I you know I'm kind of a fan of regulated sports betting. I want to make sure it's a sustainable market, and so I'm going to do my part, and I'm going to try to do all of my action uh, in regulated markets. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's regulated markets and sort of the bigger offshores. Like, I'm not dealing with. I've made the decision sort of to not deal with the paperheads and and some people that um, that I'd rather not deal with, um, and trying to keep things as simple as I can. And so, I mean, in the past, I've done a lot more with with that, and it's. I just decided it wasn't plus EV plus life EV for me um, at that point. So. Just a personal decision. Yeah. yeah. I won't uh, will you live betting the game? Uh, yeah, well, I'll have the markets up. I'll have you know if something happens, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna be watching the game here in my office. I'm gonna uh, you know have it on have it on the screen back there. Um, so yeah, I I probably will make a live bet or two on this game in some form or fashion, whether it just be the second half or whatever. I, I just can't resist um, live betting. I I've I've long since stopped watching the game with. Other people around. I, I tend to watch Super Bowl by myself. R Rufus, how about you? I'll be in Vegas with. Uh, I'll probably be with with Zach and and I don't think Ed Teach will be out there. Um, but I'll be watching. I won't be live betting. I'll probably be halftime betting it. I'll you know I'll I'll probably be intoxicated and and just sweating and having fun. It's it's a fun sweat for me. The Super Bowl. It's it's. I don't think I'm gonna have as much bet this year just because I wasn't out there early, but. Um, but it, it's uh, the, the night before the Super Bowl in previous years, I was, you know, I had, I had dreams about, about it. Um, and it was like, I had a, a quite a lot at stake and I was always very nervous about it. So in this year, I probably won't be as much, but it's still, it's, it's, it's fun. It's, it's, uh, it's exciting. And cool. Um, a couple of, I'm going to fire through these last couple of questions and we're going to call it a night. Uh, what about the, this question came up twice? So I'm going to answer this for Suns one one six. What about the shortest TD under one and a half yards? It has hit pretty often recently. Be careful with recency bias, there, Suns. Um, it's you know that just because the last few games you've watched, the under one and a half has gotten in because of a defensive pass interference penalty in the end zone, setting something up at the one. Um, these props are usually pretty well priced because they're un universal. They've been around for a long time, um, especially the over under one and a half yards on the shortest TD. So I don't think there's going to be much value on shortest TD, but you could always shop around, see if somebody's mispriced. Rufus, any comment this on that? This is one where you need, you need to think, okay, how many touchdowns are going to be scored? What does that distribution look like? I mean, and and what is the probability of each touchdown being under one and a half yards? And the Chiefs is interesting, like have not had a lot of one yard touchdowns this season at all, but I think this is something that regresses pretty strongly towards um, – well, not it regresses pretty strongly to the to the league average, just because uh, you know there is, as you said, you can get a pass interference, have the ball at the one there, and there's you can have a long play and be tackled at the one, um, and so it's mostly going to be a function just in the, of the number of touchdowns there are. But I would still say the Chiefs are less likely than the average team for to have a one yard touchdown, or, or for each touchdown to be a one yard touchdown. So um, it comes down to what you model that that at, and and how many touchdowns you have projected. I'm not going to say one way or another which one, you know, if there's an edge. Uh, Wes asks, should we wait for on some bets for the weather forecast to come out? Well, the weather forecast is technically out. Um, it is Tampa, and it is uh, early February Tampa weather. Um, five, you know, usually the five-day forecast is it gets into pretty good range in terms of 
what the weather will be. So if you, if you think there's a, a bet that you feel will be impacted by the weather, um, I would say about five days before game day. So like Tuesday ish um, might be a good day to kind of look into that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that the bets, you know, it'll affect like field goal stuff. I mean, it, well, there's a lot of it affects passing if there's a lot of wind, but at the same time you are, everybody's having is working with the same information right now with the uncertainty of the weather. It's the same, it's the same as golf. Like on a Monday, if I'm, you know, I'm betting on golf for a tournament that starts on Thursday and I have to figure out, you know, if this front that's forecasted to come in where there's going to be a lot of, you know, wind Thursday afternoon, what happens if that comes in like three hours earlier and suddenly what looks like a disadvantage for, for afternoon tea times, like is, is negated. So. Uh, Rufus, are sacks more likely in playoffs than regular season? I honestly don't know. I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't think so. Are they? I mean, it, I I'll put it this way. It's, it's, I haven't thought of this stuff while I just do props once a year. Um, but I have like controls for these different things in my code. And I'm sure I've looked at it at one point and I could, um, but just intuitively, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think so. Okay. What would be, so with something like this, you sort of, like, I, I want to have a reason you know, aside from like, like there's fewer penalties in the playoffs and I get that. I mean, and it's very consistent and, you know, referees are more likely to swallow their whistle um, in the playoffs. Like, you know, teams, well, there's, uh, I don't want to get into some of it, but um, there's certain things where I guess you can see an effect, like, you know, superstar players are probably going to be, you know, there's going to be more trick plays in the Super Bowl generally um, because a team is like, they're not, they, you know, they don't want to, they want to use all their bullets. If they have some unique play design, like Philly special, like that's the time to pull it out um, at the highest leverage moment. So I don't know with sack, like with sacks, is there a reason that they would be more likely like for the same team, given everything in a playoffs in the regular season? Well, if the team's more likely to have more pass plays, that's one reason, but is there going to be something with the defense blitzing more or the offensive line being worse or a quarterback holding the ball longer? Like, I wouldn't intuitively think so. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that reasoning. Um, I do know some people that have been heavy on sack overs in, in this game. Just, you know, neither here nor there, but that's that's an angle a lot of people are doing. And again, it goes back to that whole uh, offensive line for Kansas City uh, having some injuries. I'll be honest, I bet, uh, I bet okay. I've, I've leaned toward the sack unders, actually. Really? Okay. Well, that's like good to under know. One and a half. At, I think I got under one and a half at like plus one forty on the for the uh, well, Mahomes being sacked for the. I guess that's the Buccaneers sacks. So the when I model it, I model it as Casey being sacked. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, that's good to know. Uh, let's let's gonna do one more question here, and that's from uh, Jordan. Any first TD scores on your cards? Jordan, I'm afraid to say no. This is not a prop that I'm betting. Uh, I am surprised at how popular this prop bet has become just week to week in the NFL. Um, it seems to be the the hot prop these days. So, um, but I, it's not one that I'm I'm really looking to play. Um, it, I guess if I had to, given that there's so many different combinations of running backs with Kansas City these days, or no, you know, I'm going to take that back. Given that I'm thinking that um, Tampa Bay is more likely to receive the opening kickoff, I would probably look to bet a Tampa Bay player uh, when it comes to first TD. Um, and then you kind of narrow it down from there. You know, what is the, what is the probabilities that uh, Tom Brady runs in? Uh, what is the probabilities that, uh, you know, he, he does a long pass or do they, do they run more once they're in the red zone? Things like that. You kind of filter it down that way. Um, again, this isn't one that I'm going to try to do. Rufus, do you, do you try to attack the first TD props? I do. I mean, I have like a factor that, for example, a rushing touchdown is slightly more likely than your average touchdown to be the first touchdown. So if you have a team at 70% passing touchdowns, 30% rushing touchdowns, you know, overall, that's going to be more like 31% or something for, for first touchdown being a rushing touchdown. Um, but, uh, I have, I, I don't actually know if I have any bets on it yet. Um, unlikely. I think Ronald Jones was a guy that I thought might potentially um, that was 
someone who might have value just, but again, that's a situation where like Fournette was, was in for the first drive last week for Tampa. Um, I mean, this is one, like, I think uncertainty is your friend for something like this. So somebody with, uh, you know, Jones is someone who I think could have a lot, like could have high usage for the Super Bowl. He could also have very low usage. And so um, that is better. Like if he is the running back on the first drive of the game, which Fournette was last week, but, or even the, the second drive and he gets the entire drive, um, you know, there you know, he's, he'll be, you know, he could get a rushing touchdown. Right. And, uh, and so I think like variance is definitely your friend um, and uncertainty for the first touchdowns, if you, especially with some of these long shots. Yeah. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, there was one last comment here. We're going to close off with this. Uh, looking forward to Jeff interrupting props episode this week on Bet the Process. Uh, yeah, I think we all are. That's, so that should be that should be some fun. Uh, all right, we're going to we're going to uh, close it up here. Um, again, if you made it this far, please consider subscribing. I got a great video. It's ready to drop. Uh, it's all about how to make a hundred thousand dollars a year betting on sports. I promise it'll drop when it come. We hit ten thousand subscribers. Um, and it's sort of slowed down here. We're at 9,400. Uh, I no really want to make it video out before the Super Bowl. So um, tell your friends, see if you can subscribe here, even if you've unsubscribed after I get to 10,000, just so everybody else can finally see this damn video that I made. Um, but please go ahead and like and subscribe this video. It really means a lot to me when you guys do that. Rufus, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you, you know, I call you the Prince of Props. You're incredibly busy this week. You dropped a lot of knowledge for us. Um, thank you so much, my friend. It was, it was great to talk to you. Well, you know, I always, I always love coming on and talk with you, Captain Jack, and hopefully I said something useful. So I, yeah, good luck yeah, everybody. I, I thank you. And, uh, I'm going to go bet some of the stuff you said right now, in fact. So, um, all right. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for stopping in.